God be the glory for all the things he has done. For how many of you know the blood still works? The blood still works and we thank God that all praises be to the Lord our King for he's endured all the glory and all the praise. If you'll go with me to the book of Acts the book of Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 1. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. Book of Acts chapter 1, verse 7 through 12. If you have it, say amen. Well, y'all quit. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. We won't hold you long this morning, so give me a whole lot of amens, and then we'll, we'll move on. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. I will read the book of it, and I'm going to ask that we will read verse 12 together. If you're ready, say amen. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Shall we read verse 12 together? Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, I ask that you give me preaching power, for you have blessed me with a mind to study. Father, you have blessed me with a heart to love your people, Father, but Father, you have blessed me in times of preparation. Now, Father, I stand only to declare what you have given. If I do anything more, I ask that you will sit me down. If I do any less, I ask that you will keep me up. For Father, I hear for the ultimate purpose not to be seen, not to be heard, not to be congratulated, but that a life may be changed and a soul may be reconciled unto you. And Father, if that be done, I will be well pleased in what I have done, but most of all, I know that it's because of your power and your glory that I stand in this moment. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Look at your neighbor. Grab him by the hand. Look at him with all seriousness that you can, but have a smile on your face and say, neighbor, the preacher's going to talk about now what? Now turn to somebody else. Look at him. Have a smile, but look at him with all the seriousness that you have and say, neighbor, pray for the preacher. He's going to do this as quickly as possible. And he's going to talk about, now what? Now turn to somebody behind you, look at him and say, now what? Somebody give me an amen right along in here, amen. Now what, now what? Easter Sunday morning, which we celebrate last Sunday, comes, always comes with great enthusiasm because it is taught as the climax of Jesus' earthly ministry. And any time you experience a climactic experience, the question that must be answered is, now what? 
it, uh, it, it's a wonderful feeling to see Salem put in new carpet and to see our sanctuary transformed. But the question is, after this project is completed, now what? Uh, uh, often we put so much effort and focus on what happens before the climax that we forget that something got to happen after. Uh, one of my favorite stories in scripture is, is the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Uh, this woman who met Jesus at the well. Y'all know the, one, the story. She comes in the heat of the day because she don't want to have any confrontations or, 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 or any kind of ridicule from the people. She meets Jesus. Jesus tells her to go call her husband. She said, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right because you have four and now you're trying to steal number five from somebody else. And, 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 and after that encounter, the Bible says she declares that he's a prophet. And after talking about worship, she drops her water bucket, runs into the town and said, come see a man that told me everything. But my question is, the reason why I'm fascinated with this story, uh, Brother Kazee, is I want to know what happened the next day when number five called her to meet up. I wish I had a witness here. After God has transformed your life, after you have had a divine encounter with God, the question you have to answer is, now what? Uh, this is the point where Satan often attacks us. It is not a coincidence that Jesus was tempted immediately after he was baptized. Often, watch this, Salem, your greatest challenge occurs after your greatest victory. It was after Elijah called down fire from heaven that he faced a death threat from Queen Jezebel. It was after Joseph shared his dream that his brothers threw him in a pit. And so the question I have for you, and so whenever God reveals greatness in your life, you must be prepared to answer the question, now what? Here we find the disciples and the church 40 days after the resurrection. And Jesus had appeared to them twice in the upper room and called Peter again from fishing on the sea. It's interesting, Jesus always appears to move his disciples from one level of faith to another. He never appeared, nor does he ever use his power to accomplish anything that is, unless it is valuable to the kingdom of God. Are y'all still with me here? Uh, in other words, God won't do it unless the kingdom gets something out of it. Let me say that again. God will not do it unless the kingdom gets something out of it. This is why seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you as such a powerful declaration, because it teaches God will not move into in your life unless the kingdom gains something out of your life. We say it all the time, when praises go up, what? Blessings come down. You got to give the kingdom something if you want the kingdom to give something to you. Because it teaches God will not move unless the kingdom gains something from your life. And so if you want God to, to do it, make sure the kingdom gets some glory. Somebody shout glory. For every miracle that Jesus ever performed was designed to bring glory to God and his kingdom. When he meets a blind man in John chapter 9, he tells the crowd, neither they ask the question, which man sinned, either him or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus said, nobody sinned, but that the works of God may be made manifested in him. In other words, I'm going to use his condition to bring about glory to the kingdom of God. Therefore, God healed him. And when God healed him, the world would cry out to God, uh, be the glory. The lesson I want you to get, Salem, this morning is the more glory God can get from you, the more power he can pour into you. Somebody missed that. I said the more glory God can get from you, the more power God, y'all, I'm going to say it one more time, the more glory God can get from you, the more power he can pour into you. If you don't give God glory, why would God give you more power? Sometimes if you want more power, you got to give God more glory. The Bible says, let everything that has what? Breath, praise the Lord. And so the more you want God to do, you have to give God glory from your life. Everything you do in life should be done to bring glory back to God. 
Whatever you do, everything you do, at some point in your day, you must do something to give God glory. When you go to work, you have to work as a faithful servant so that God gets glory from your profession. You have to love your children. You have to love your spouse. That God gives glory from our relationship. If you want God to bless it, I dare you to give him glory in the midst of it. This is why he was locked in the upper room. The question I have for you here is why would Jesus leave his disciples? Because how they responded the last time he left. You remember on Good Friday when he was crucified and buried in Joseph of Amethyst's tomb, Reverend Annette, the Bible says the disciples were nowhere to be found. They locked themselves up in a room, fearing that they would be the next ones to die on the cross. Uh, while he was locked in a grave, they were locked in an upper room. And so considering their reaction to the last time Jesus separated himself from them, why would Jesus leave this time? To understand this, you must understand how God uses our faith to develop a deeper relationship with him. Are y'all going to walk with me here? Uh, yet faith is often taught as a one-step process. And faith is often taught from only one verse of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. This is the only verse oftentimes faith is taught out of. But in reality, it's impossible, watch this, it's impossible to get saved on Sunday and walk by faith on Monday. Y'all going to be real with me here. I, I said, I, I know you holy. I know you sanctified. I know you snatched from the burning fire. I know he picked you up, turned you around, placed your feet on a solid ground. I know you are got the joy of the Lord in your heart. Your, mind, your heart is fixed. Your mind has been made up. Can't nobody turn you around. But the truth be told, it's hard to meet Jesus today and walk by faith tomorrow. Y'all going to walk with me here. Uh, Sometimes, often, we are very critical of people because we expect them to develop instantly what it took you a lifetime, lifetime to get. You got to understand that faith is a process. Faith is a lifelong transformation. Faith has nothing to do with how long you've been a member. Faith has nothing to do with how many scriptures you can recite. Faith has nothing to do with how many Baptist meetings you have attended. Faith has nothing to do whether you were black on first Sunday, white on the first Sunday, turquoise on the third Sunday. Life, faith has nothing to do whether you say amen when the preachers say amen. Faith has nothing to do whether you're in the choir, on the usher board, in Sunday school. School, faith is a lifelong transformation and sometimes the reason why we have so much chaos in the church is we expecting people to develop overnight when you ain't finishing developing yourself you can't expect somebody to be at your level when you I wish I had a witness here it's a lifelong process somebody say it takes a lifetime it takes a lifetime to learn how to effectively walk by faith. I'm going to teach you three steps of this faith process, and I'm going to leave you alone. Paul teaches that when you accept him, God saves your soul. But your mind still needs to be transformed. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Uh, when you come down the aisle, your soul is saved. But your mind is still, I wish I had a witness here. <laughs> this is why you can be in church in the midst of a Holy Ghost explosion. Yeah, right. And all of a sudden, your mind will go left. I wish I had a witness here. <laughs> have, have you ever been trying to be holy, trying to fake like your mind ain't on something else? The truth is, somebody, your body is here, but your mind is back on that TXU bill you left on the coffee table before you left home this morning. You can be in church. That's why you got to be careful. That's why we got to be forgiving because I want to be holy, but there's an old man down on the inside of me. There's an old thought that's still in my mind, and if I'm not careful, I want to quote a scripture, but I'll tell you what I want to tell you because my soul has been saved, but my mind is still being trapped. <laughs> Are y'all going to help me preach this morning? Uh, may, maybe I'm by myself. Somebody in here smiling, but my grandmother told me every girl that's smiling ain't happy. <laughs> I wish I had that. that that's a marriage tip. Y'all hold on to that. Here. 
What we got to realize is that, that your soul is saved, but your mind has to constantly be renewed. I came to tell somebody, don't get so holy that you stop transforming your mind. Uh, uh, too often, watch this, this is profound. Too often, we guard our souls, but we leave our minds exposed. Uh, for you can guard, you can't guard your soul and listen to everything and everybody around you. You, you, I wish, let, let, me, let me come a little closer. Y'all getting quiet on me here. For, for you, watch this, you don't have to listen to everybody. But God expects you to love everybody. Oh, let, let me say that again. Uh, you, God wants you to speak to everybody. But God never commands you to listen to everybody. Uh, I may speak to you, but that don't mean I have to listen to you. Because the truth be told, some people are poisonous people. I will, ooh, somebody ought to pray amen. Some, some people are poisonous people. And if you talk to them long enough, they will change your mind uh, from a positive outlook to a negative outlook. You got to be careful when you hang around bitter people because bitter people will turn your good day into a bad day. Uh, so I can speak to you, but I don't have to. I wish I had a praying church here. Have you ever had a good day, a good experience, and thank God you sat next to the wrong person? And that person woke up mad. They went to bed mad. They ate their breakfast mad. They drove their car mad. They came to church mad. And because they mad, they want everybody around them to be mad. And so instead of talking about what's going right, they are talking about everything that... I wish I had a witness here. And if you're not careful, then that spirit will jump off of them and come on you. That's why, baby, there's nothing wrong with saying hi and I got something else to do. Because you got to understand, God wants you to love one another, but there are some, there, it's a spirit thing. I wish I had a witness here. I can't, let me throw this in for free. Don't you know, I don't know, this may be my last day. So why would I spend my last day making it my worst day? And so if you are not going to ex be excited over your day, I'm going to be excited over my day because I don't want my, this day to be my last day. And God asked me, how come you didn't smile uh, on the last day that you have on earth? And so I don't know about you, but that's why Grandmama told me, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. You, got, oh, you, got, you can speak to everybody, but you don't have to listen. You don't have to entertain everybody. I, I can, can I work with this thing here? Uh, faith is a process. It does not happen instantly. That's why the ascension and not the resurrection is the, is the culmination of Jesus' earthly ministry. I'm going to tell you three things. First of all, the first stage of faith is found in our scripture. We, we walk by faith and not by sight. Embedded in this principle is this. You cannot learn how to walk by faith until you learn how to walk by sight. Before you can walk with your eyes closed, you got to learn how to walk with your eyes. Are y'all going to pray with me here? Uh, because this stage is about God developing your vision. God leads you from in front of you. Uh, for, for when you accept him, God walks in front of you so that you can easily see him. This is important because you cannot trust God when you can't see him until you learn how to trust him when you can see him. For the sheep cannot learn to recognize the shepherd's voice until they learn how to recognize the shepherd's faith. For, for the sheep cannot learn to recognize his voice unless they learn how to recognize the shepherd. And so the first level of faith deals with your vision. Somebody shout vision. This is important because at this level, you have to stay focused on who's in front of you and not who's behind you. Now, let me take you to high school. I was a heck of an athlete back in high school. And I, I was fine. I had muscles. I had deltoids. I had six-pack abs. I tell you, I was I, Superman didn't have nothing on me. And, and so, but, but what happened is we used to run, and I don't, don't think I still don't got it. Amen. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Uh, well, what we would do in, in, in track, we, we used to run track, and I had a coach named Gene Ponce, and Coach Ponce said, the hardest race to run 
is the one you in the lead. Because when you're in the lead, you have a tendency to listen to the footsteps behind you. Are uh, y'all going to pray with me here? And, and, and if you listen to the footsteps behind you, you will automatically start losing your speed. And so when you're in the lead, you got to learn how to stay focused on the finish line. Because what's more important is where you're going, not who you passed. And what I'm trying to get you to understand, when you first get hooked up with Jesus, you got to keep your eyes on him and not the folk you have left behind. Because the truth be told, every once in a while, you're going to have some, hear some footsteps of folks trying to come up behind you. But no wonder the Bible says, I will look up to the hills from which cometh my help. I press towards the mark of the high calling which is called in Christ Jesus. I came to encourage somebody because I want you to know you can't be intimidated nor eliminated by the folk you have already passed up. Oftentimes we slow ourselves down listening to the footsteps behind us. But as long as God is in front of you, you got to press your way. Somebody say press your way. You got to press your way forward. You can't be concerned about the people God is separating you from. You cannot be concerned by your, the people who used to hang out with you, getting mad at you because now you're a little bit too holy for them. You can't be deterred by the footsteps behind you. You got to keep your focus on where you're going and not where you're coming from. You got to learn how to press your way. Somebody say, press your way. Let me tell you, this is a daily journey. On Monday, you got to press your way. On Tuesday, you got to press your way. On Wednesday and Thursday, you got to press your way. You can never take your eyes off of where you're going and look back because the Bible says a workman putting his hand to the plow looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You got to keep your eyes on him to go where he wants you to go. That's the first step. Second step is this, the second level. Is a frustrating level, Reverend Nett, because God moves from in front of you to behind you. First, you learn to walk when you see him. Now you have to learn how to walk when you can't see him. It's frustrating because when God moves, it appears that he has removed and not repositioned himself. Come here, uh, minister, uh, come on, Joshua, come on up here and help me. If, if, if you're going to be God. You feel holy today? All right. <laughs> you're going to be God. Now, you're going to walk in front of me. This, yo, don't walk. Just stand right there. You, you're in front of me, and, and, and since I accepted Jesus Christ, I've always seen God in front of me. And so before I needed to make a decision, God was always there. It was very clear. I can see the moment that I accept him, he's always been there. Every time I seek him, I found him. Every time I looked for him, he was right there. He was always in the same spot. But the Bible says when the children of Israel got to the Red Sea, the Bible says something happened. Up until that point, God led them from in front. But what God does is go behind them. He goes behind them. Now, the reason why it's frustrating, because now I look for God and I can't find him. Because I'm expecting, y'all better wake up and talk to me, because now I'm expecting God to be in the same place that I last saw him. So now it feels like God is not with me. It feels like God has left me. This is why you on fire for the Lord for your first year, but the first time you have a great mountain to climb and it looks like you can't see him, now you think God has left you. God has not left you. He has just repositioned himself because on this level, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now it's important to get a word in your spirit because when you can't see him, you have to learn to hear him. Some, just, just call my name. Say Todd. Todd. Now, I can't see Joshua, but keep saying Todd. Todd. I can't see Joshua. Todd. I can't Todd. see him. Todd. I can't 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 see him. Todd. But now my ear tells me you don't have to see him because I hear him. And even though when I can't see him, as long as I can hear him, I know he is still with me. Somebody ought to pray and talk with me here. Thank you, my brother. You got to learn how to have faith when you can't see him, but you can hear him. Sometimes when you're in a hospital and you're listening to a doctor, you're listening to your heavenly doctor who is saying, hold on just a little while longer. Everything will. We'll be all right. 
I want to know, do I got anybody here that ever heard the voice of Jesus? I couldn't see him, but I heard him late in the midnight hour. Saying, every, in the morning, every weeping may endure for a night, but John cometh in the morning. It amazes me that, that oftentimes, uh, you, have you ever been at a funeral and you done lost your loved one? You're looking at a casket, but you're hearing a voice in your ear saying, the, the day that die in Christ shall live with me. Sometimes I tell you, Salem, you got to get to the level where you don't have to see him to believe him. I don't have to see it to know it's going to happen. I don't have to see the job to know I already got the job. I don't have to see a way to already know he's going to make a way. Because sometimes I don't have to see it. I just got to hear it. Often we get frustrated when we can't see it. But God says sometimes you got to close your eyes to open your ears. But let me throw this in for free. You got, when you want to hear God, you got to not only know how God sounds, you got to know how God talks. Because God has a certain vocabulary. Let me give you an example here. The other day, I was in the office, and a lot of times when I'm here, especially when I'm by myself, I'm locked up tight. I was here, and I heard the door open, and a few seconds later, I said, how you doing, Brother Coleman? Brother Coleman came to the office and said, well, how did you know it was me? I said, well, because I know what you sound like. Because every time Brother Coleman comes in the door, he has a tendency to whistle. And Brother Coleman has a unique way of walking. And so now I can say, how you doing, Brother Coleman, before he comes to my office because my ear has already confirmed what my eyes are waiting to see. I wish I had a witness here. What I came to tell somebody, that's why you can shout when everything looks like it's going wrong because I just heard the Lord walk in the building. If nothing has changed, I haven't seen him yet, but my ears saying, I just hold on, he's coming. He's already entered into the building. So you got to learn how to hear him. 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 Have you ever looked for God but couldn't find him? Have you ever looked for God and you couldn't see him? But let me tell you, oftentimes you got to hear him coming even before he's arrived. Because this ability allows you to have peace in the midst of hell and high water because you can hear him coming even before he arrives. For if you want to have peace, you got to hear him coming. Because joy always arrives when the Lord changes up. Before he comes, you got to hear him. Before he changes it, you got to hear him. Before he improves it, you got to hear him. You got to learn to hear God, but when, even when you can't see God. Are y'all going to walk with me here? Uh, Elijah stood on a mountain, and he stood on a mountain, and after 40 days of a long drought, he looks, and all he sees, Brother Coleman, is a cloud the size of a man's hand. And he says, he goes back, and he has a smile on his face. He says, I've heard the sound of an abundance of rain. All I see is a small cloud, but I'm not focusing on what I can see. I'm shouting over what I can hear. Let me tell you, Salem, you got to hear it if you want to see it. You got to be able to hear improvement before you see improvement. You got to be able to hear love before you can see love. On this level, it's not about what you can see. It's about what you can hear. This is what happens in our text today. The movement, Jesus, the moment Jesus ascends out of their sight, the angel appears and asks a question, why stand ye here gazing? Somebody say, now what? Now, now that Jesus has left, the disciples and the church are now looking up to heaven wow. and asking themselves the question, now what? Wow. Every time we had a problem, he was right there. Wow. Every time we needed him, he was right there. Peter, you remember when we fished all night and caught nothing and Jesus showed up and he told us to cast the net down on the right side of the ship and we caught more fish than we ever had? Now he's gone now. What? You remember when the Pharisees and the scribes wanted to destroy us, wanted us to kill us, but Jesus showed up and said, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. But now he's gone. Now what? Somebody say, now what? 
Now that you can't see him, now what? Now that he's gone, now what? Now that he's back in heaven, now what? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when the devil said, now you got a diagnosis, now what? What do you do when the devil say, now you broke, now what? What do you do when the devil say, they laid you off yesterday, now what? What do you do when you have a Holy Ghost time at church, but when you get home, all hell is breaking loose, and the devil said, now what? What do you do when you try to love your spouse, and the more you love them, the more they act crazy? What? And the devil said, now what? What do you do when you love the people that you worship with, but as soon as your back is turned, they talk about you like you ain't a child of God, and the devil said, now what? What do you do when you throw up all the praise that you have, and you say, this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and suddenly when you get home, they don't repossess your car, your lights are turned off, your water is not flowing, and the devil says, you praised all Sunday morning, now what? What do you do when you done love your children and you gave them everything that you could, but they made one bad decision after another bad decision, and somebody asks you the question, now what? Now that they in jail, now what? Now that you can't afford a lawyer, now what? What do you do when Satan comes in your life and say, you love God, but now what? I know y'all look perfect, but anybody ever been there before where the devil looks at you in the face? And say, now what? Late in the midnight hour where you know you don't have enough to make it to tomorrow. Yeah. Somebody asks you the question, now what? Yeah. Now what? Let me tell you, now what? Now what? The answer to this question is found in the last part of what the angel said. The angel says, why are you stand here gazing? This same Jesus. Oh, I lost my mind when he said that. This same Jesus. What you got to understand, the same God that called you in the first place is still the same God that will walk with you right now. The same God that got you through last year will get you through this year. The same God that picked you up yesterday will pick you up today. The same God that healed your body when you got diagnosed the last time will heal your body right now. The same Jesus who turned water to wine still got power. The same Jesus that called Lazarus from the grave still has power. The same Jesus. Same God, when you face your now what, you got to tell everybody in here, now what? Now, yeah. let me tell you, now, now what is not a question. Now what is a declaration? Yeah. Because when I was growing up, as long as me and my brother, because sometimes it's good to have a twin that'll fight with you. <laughs> because when somebody would mess with one of us, you got to know you got to fight both of us. And so when somebody would pick on my brother, somebody would pick on me, as long as my brother was beside me, I didn't get scared. I just told that bully, now what? Now that you're going to have to fight both of us, now what you going to do? You got to learn that God will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. And so when the devil comes in your life, you got to look at him straight in the face and say, now what you going to do? Now that God is on my side, now what? I know you don't like me, but now what? I know you can't stand me, but now what? I know you won't promote me, but now what? Because the same Jesus that got me through it before, will get me through it right now. Somebody ought to have a now what faith in the midst of your problems. Somebody ought to shout now what. I know I ain't got it, but now what. I know I can't pray them, but now what. Somebody ought to shout with me. Tell every devil in hell I know. Somebody ought to slap your neighbor and say now what. Now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? When praises go up, blessings come down. Now what? Now what? Are y'all going to walk with me here? And if I can use my sanctified imagination, they killed him on Friday. But early Sunday morning, Jesus got up like he was from South Dallas and said, now what? I was dead yesterday, but now what? I am he. It was dead. Now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? 
I'm sick. Now what? I got laid off. Now what? I got enemies around me. Now what? I'm a little bit older now. But now what? My life ain't what I thought it would be. But now what? The same Jesus that got up on Sunday morning is the same Jesus that can get me up now. Now what? Now what? Now what? Do I got any now what believers in the room? Now what? When the devil meets you on the steps of this church and say, you shouted, but I'm still waiting on it. You praised him, but I'm still here. You blessed the church, you gave your tithes and your offering, but I still got problems waiting for you. I don't want you to go out with a question. I want you to leave this place with a declaration. I know you're waiting on me, Satan, but now what? I know you waited on me to show up. Now what? Go back to work tomorrow, and the folk that plotted your demise just pass and speak and say, my pastor told me to tell you, 